Okay, hey guys, welcome back. Just getting the stream going really quick. But uh, we have about four or three minutes actually till, till class time and therefore we're just hanging in here for a few minutes. But welcome back, hope you're doing really well. And uh, yeah, we'll get started in just a few. Hey there, Nicholas. Thanks again for being here. <clears throat> hey, Sarah. <clears throat> Welcome back. Kevin, says Hi, everybody. Hi, Spencer. Hey, Brennan, Catherine, welcome back. Hey, David, Sylvia, Jasmine. Good to see everybody. I don't know how the weather is, where you guys are at. I'm in Long Beach, and it's been kind of rainy. We had some storms in the morning. It's nice to be out in March, but geez, where's the warm weather? Hi, Angelina, Alan, AJ. <clears throat> Maria, hi, how's it going? <clears throat> Hello, Alicia, Annalie. See everyone. <clears throat> oh, snowing where? Spencer. Hi, even Tina. Hi, <clears throat> Gabby. Oh, Big Bear. Mm -hmm. Well. That's nice, I guess, if you're trying to get out there on the mountain. <clears throat> okay. All right, guys. Yeah, so um, it's pretty much 2.30, so I'm going to let us get started again. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. Good afternoon. Um, I'm sure you know this, but if you didn't remember, just make sure that you have sent me your um, first essay. They're due today, so... I should have received them, but if I haven't yet, um, just feel free to send me those when you got a, a free moment. Um, I've been confirming the receipt of each message, each email essay that I've received. Uh, I had a class from 1 to 2.15, but up until 1 p.m., I had sent back confirmation to all those that I've received. So if you've sent me your essay between 1 p.m. and now, um, I'll hit you with a quick confirmation right after the class ends here. So just be aware of that. But anyway... Uh, thanks so much for your hard work, everyone, on the first paper. I know that you probably have other class assignments and things that are on your plate right now, but anyway, now you've got that behind you, and that's great. So we look forward to the next thing in the semester, which is going to be the midterm exam. And for our class, the midterm exam happens on um, Monday, March the 22nd. So not next week, not the week after that, but the Monday of week nine. That's the next thing coming forward. So we've got a couple of more lectures between now and then. We're going to finish off discussion of ethics and ethical theory and some applied ethical issues. And then we're going to have some uh, review session based on the study guide that I'll send to you guys about a week or so before the midterm. But I'll be grading your guys' first paper starting now, and I'll be working on it through the week. It may take me into next weekend or so just because of all the different assignments that I'm working on, um, and I want to be detailed and thorough. But, you know, you'll know very soon, next week, I think, before the end of the week, I should be able to notify you that they're all done. And then at that point, you can email me for your grade and your comments. So, yeah, the class moves on. We finished the first essay. Now you look forward to the midterm on March 22nd. And then after we get back from spring break, then we have part two of the class, which is just another essay and then a final exam. So that's how it looks for now. 
Uh, as usual, please, if you have a chance at any time to lift, leave a comment behind in the chat, and that's my sort of informal ongoing attendance verification thing. And if you ever have questions or comments or anything else in the during the meeting, please let me know and I'll answer in the chat. Okay, guys, so sounds good. Let's go ahead and return to what we were finishing last time. Last time we were wrapping up the work of Immanuel Kant. And um, let me just bring you back into that discussion and we'll we'll finish it up. So Immanuel Kant is another major moral philosopher in Western history. We started with John Stuart Mill and utilitarianism. And then we try to show you another ethical system given by Immanuel Kant, the German philosopher of the 18th century. So his view overall is that what you should be trying to do morally is just act with a good will and with good intention. If you act with a good will and with good intent, then the consequences of the action, whether they play out well or not, don't matter morally. Um, that's different from utilitarianism, which was totally focused on the consequences and how they bear out for overall human happiness. So like in a case that we could imagine where a person takes an action with the best intentions, but it leads to harm, Kant would not fault the person morally for having done that because it's not the consequences that are judged, it's the intent. And in that case, the intention was good. Um, so we then moved on from that initial description of the view to explain that um, in Kant's writing, he says that the only thing in the whole world that's unconditionally good is the goodwill. And all other things aside from the goodwill are not good unconditionally, but are only good under certain conditions and not others. So for example, if you guys remember, he talked about how things like intelligence, bravery, dedication, um, charisma, power, wealth, even happiness, that all those other things cannot be claimed to be good no matter what, basically. They're not good no matter what, they're not unconditionally good. It depends because if a person has intelligence and they have an evil intent and a bad will, then that's not a good thing. That's not the kind of intelligence that is a moral good thing because it means they're just gonna use the smart intelligence and clever you know, thinking that they have to be more skilled and effective at doing bad things. So intelligence in the wrong hands is not something good or valuable. Um, and the same with all the other qualities. If a person's very brave, they're willing to face danger, but if they're willing to face danger in the service of evil, we hope that they're a little more afraid uh, to face the danger. So intelligence, bravery, etc., they can be good if the person who wields the quality has the good will. But if not, then they can be bad. So instead of focusing your life on trying to become the smartest or bravest or anything else, you should find uh, your first priority to have a good will and act with good intent. Because then that makes proper use of all the other um, estimable qualities. And um, it also makes you worthy of the possession of happiness itself, which Kant says even happiness is not unconditionally good because it can be derived from immoral sources and also because a person with a bad will um, who, has not, who, who has happiness is not going to ever change and it's going to be content in their evil ways. And to a benevolent spectator, it's like disgusting to see a person happy and content as they're doing evil things. I don't know if any of you guys watch any like Netflix, but when I was watching The Night Stalker with Richard Ramirez, and you know, he's murdered a lot of women, and you know, he's totally unapologetic in the courtroom. He's standing up there, he's like, hail Satan, what? Like, yeah, I did it, he's happy about it, he's laughing. So that's disgusting, right? That's happiness, I guess, for him. But for anybody else, you would look at that and you'd say, man, happiness in this case is not a morally good thing. So the one thing that's good no matter what is the goodwill. And so what is the goodwill? He says the goodwill is shown when you act from the motive of duty to uphold the moral law. And we were talking about how the motive of duty is the only kind of motive that can give an action moral worth, but that an action which is done from the motive of inclination lacks moral worth. And that's kind of where we ended last time. So I was going to explain to you guys the shopkeeper scenario. Before I do it though, one last question. Who can remind me or tell the class, what is an inclination? To, be, to have an inclination to do something is just a fancy way of saying what? Hi everybody, it's good to see you guys. I see you arriving to the meeting and thanks so much. Don't forget to submit your essay if you haven't done it yet to me or to my email address. But the question is, yeah, want or desire. That's what an inclination is. So. This shopkeeper example is supposed to illustrate how um, having the motive of duty is the only kind of motive where the action has moral value. And if it's done instead from the motive of desire, self-interest, or pleasure, then it does not have moral value. Okay, shopkeeper example. I'm just going to write it on the board, even though that's not going to add much detail, but I, uh, I want us to 
set the stage. So this is now the scenario, okay? Hey, Ricardo. Um, okay, so suppose there's a guy who runs a shop. This guy owns and operates like a little convenience store. It could be like a liquor store, something like that, right? So he works the register up there, and he owns and operates this little business. So suppose one day a little kid comes into the, to the shop, and it's like a young elementary school, very young school-aged child, all right? So the child sees a item that he wants. Let's say it's a candy bar. Picks this up, and he walks up to the counter, and he says, excuse me, how much is this? Right? He wants to buy it. Now, let's, let's imagine here are the thoughts of the shopkeeper at that time. The shopkeeper's like, wait a minute, okay, he's asking how much does it cost? What will I say to him? Because um, here's the thing, the real price, the retail value, like for any normal customer, is a dollar. That, that candy bar is worth one dollar retail value. But he's asking me how much it costs, he obviously doesn't know, and he's so young and naive, totally inexperienced. I could say to him a number that's higher than the real price, and I could basically rip him off and inflate the price, gouge the price on this young kid. There's a saying, have you ever heard of taking candy from a baby? Well, this is taking money from a baby for candy, but anyway, he's thinking about it. He's tempted to do that. He's, you know, he's got his own interest in getting that extra money because maybe then he could buy a lottery ticket for himself or he could pocket the money for bus fare or for a parking meter, whatever. He just really kind of feels like getting that extra few dollars. So he's thinking about it. He's like... He, he asks how much it costs, and the real price is a dollar, but I could tell him three or four, whatever, and he would just pay and say thank you and leave. So maybe I rip him off. That's what I really want to do. That's what he's inclined to do. But he says to himself after that, he, he continues thinking, and he's like, ah, but all those silly college classes on ethics are coming back to haunt me now, even though I kind of feel like ripping this young kid off. I know it's just not right. I know that's not fair. So I guess duty calls. And so he opens his mouth and he's like, all right, um, I was just thinking for a minute as you asked your question. Sorry, I got distracted. But anyway, what you asked, how much is it? It's a dollar. That's the candy bar price. So it's a dollar. Kid's like, okay, here's a dollar. I wonder why he sounds so disappointed, but thanks. And he buys it and leaves. Okay. So transaction is over. So focus on the details of that example as I change it just a little bit. Version two. Okay. Same initial setup. There's a shopkeeper, owns and operates the shop. Little kid walks in, wants to buy something. It's a candy bar, gets to the counter. How much is this? Now, in the second version, imagine it's a different type of shopkeeper. And the second individual, when the question comes to him, he immediately, with no hesitation, he's like, oh, I'm so happy you asked me, and I'm going to tell you exactly how much it is. It's a dollar. It's a dollar for you, and it would be a dollar for me or for anybody else. And that's just how basic fairness works, my young friend. In fact, you know, there's a lot of shopkeepers out there that in my same position, they would have ripped you off right now. But I would never do that. And one of the reasons, the main reason is because I love children and I just love fairness. And in fact, when I get a chance to be fair and honest to a kid like you, whereas others might have ripped you off, that fills me with such joy and euphoria. It's intense. It's just so much pleasure. I'm having the greatest time being fair to you, my young friend. So this is a pure joy. Thanks. It's a dollar. The kid's like, well, that was weird. But anyway, here's a dollar. And he buys it and leaves. Okay, now. I've explained the scenario, and I've given you these two different variations on it. One thing to notice is this. In both versions of the case, the fair price was given to the child, right? It was $1, and version shopkeeper 1 gave the right price, and so did number 2. But I'm now going to ask you about the motivation of the two shopkeepers. So shopkeeper number 1, who really wanted to rip this kid off but forced himself to stick to the, the fair price, did he do that? Why did he give the fair price, the first shopkeeper? Did he do it because it was his, because of his, uh, he felt like it was his duty? Or did he do it because he just wanted to do it? Was our first shopkeeper inclined to give a fair price? Is that why he gave the fair price? Because he felt like he wanted to? Or did he do it just because it was duty? That's the question. Shopkeeper one, what was his motive, inclination or duty? The first one. Let me know what you think. And hi, Miguel, good to see you too. That's right. In the first case, it was duty. Um, now, Gabby, you're saying it might have been that he felt bad. Uh, well, actually, let me say something. He would not have felt bad ripping the kid off. He wanted to do it. Um, he actually feels bad giving him a fair price. It's not making him happy to give a fair price. He gives the fair price, and he watches him walks out, and he's like, man, I mean, there goes a missed opportunity to take some extra money. Morality sucks, but, you know, duty calls. So it, it's it's sort of... Not necessary to say that he felt bad. Um, it's not necessarily like a guilty conscience hit him. It's just he recognized it was a duty, and so he did it, even though he didn't want to do it, even though he did not feel like doing it. 
fact, he felt bad about doing the right thing because he just wanted the extra money, but he did it anyway. Okay, so he did it just out of duty's sake. It's not that he felt good about it. He didn't want to do that fair thing, but he made himself do it just out of principle alone, just the pure principle that that's the fair price. Now, take the second person. You already know the answer to my question, but what was the other guy's motive? Shopkeeper number two. Well, the shopkeeper number two did it because it felt good and it made him happy. He did it because it's pleasurable for him, to be fair. So he did it because of the inclination that he already has to derive pleasure from being fair to children. So now we come back to Kant's statement. He says that which kind of action receives moral worth? He says only an action done from the motive of duty has moral worth. So even if it sounds a little weird to you, Kant would have this position that it is shopkeeper one, his action has moral worth. Shopkeeper two, who did it out of the sake of pleasure, that action has no moral worth. Now, it's not that in the second case the action was immoral, but it's kind of just amoral. It has no moral status because it wasn't done for a moral reason. It wasn't done based on moral principles. It was done in the pursuit of pleasure and out of desire. So that's not the kind of motive that is a moral motivation. Um, whenever I teach this, I understand some of you may have a, a confused reaction to that because you might look at the first shopkeeper and think, but isn't that like not as good a person as the second one? Because the second guy, he just feels good about doing the right thing. He doesn't have to sort of like force himself to do it, even though he doesn't want it. But having taught this so many times, I think I've come closer to understanding Kant's true message here. What he is saying is that you really only award moral credit or praise to a person when what they have done was difficult for them, not easy, not just that they felt like doing it already. Okay, so like take this as another ver example. Suppose you have two different runners. Me, myself, I'm a big runner. I run like almost every day. So anyway, take you have two daily runners. They each get up in the morning, and they both do an identical routine, like three miles in the morning. And um, But here's the difference between them. Runner number one, when he wakes up, he's like, oh, my God, I hate running. Not another day of this three-mile thing. It's just so, so just undesirable. I hate the way it feels when I'm running. I don't like the soreness. I don't like the sweating and the heavy breathing. But you know what? I feel like I have a duty to myself to be healthy. And I know it's a good thing to have cardiovascular health. So as much as I hate running and I derive no enjoyment from it, I'm going to go through the motions and make myself do it because I think it's healthy and therefore I will on principle. Now take the other guy, runner number two. He does the same exact everyday morning routine. In fact, maybe these two guys pass each other on their opposite routes. But runner number two, when he wakes up, he's got a whole different disposition. He's like, ah, oh, I can't wait another day for me to go running, which is my favorite thing in the world. It's like what I would do on my birthday. If it's like something that's just for me, which I love. I, all the things that number one guy hates about it, number two loves. He's like, I love the sweat. I love the exertion, the heavy breathing, just getting out there in the morning and seeing people wake up. It's, it's a joy to me. It's my favorite thing to do. So out of those two people, number one and two, who do you think would be more appropriate to say, hey, credit to you for sticking with the running? You know, you deserve praise for that. Is it the one who already enjoys it and would have it no other way? Or is it the person for whom it is difficult and it requires a little bit of a struggle to overcome their disinclination? You give praise to the first one. No, Diego, you give praise to the first one because they hate doing it and they're forcing themselves to do it anyway. It would make no sense, Diego, to say to the second person, hey, good job for doing your favorite thing that you enjoy more than anything. You don't need moral praise for that. You're doing it because it's already enjoyable, not because it's some kind of moral principle. Let me give you another example, Diego, and maybe this one will make a little more sense to you. And that's okay, but either way, let me give you another example. Um, go with diet. So you got two people that are both on an identical, very restrictive, healthy diet. So this is like, you guys know about Tom Brady and all that? It's like the Tom Brady hardcore extreme diet, like no sugar, no fatty foods, um, no fried foods, everything macrobiotic, extremely controlled portions. Okay. Uh, so that's a very strict diet. Now suppose person number one is on it and they're like, I hate this diet. There's nothing good to eat. All this food just sucks. It's bland. I can't ever have like a, a really indulgent, you know, dessert or big fried meal. I hate it, but you know what? It's healthy and I feel like I should be healthy. So as much as I hate eating this way and living this way, I'm going to stick with it out of concern for health. Now another person on the same diet, except it's their favorite food. It's like, this is literally their favorite food. Like how your favorite food is whatever pizza or sushi or something. Their favorite food is like a big platter of macrobiotic greens with no sugar, no salt, and no fried anything, no oil. So like this person, they find all that other stuff people eat, salty, fried, sweet foods, just disgusting and gross. And they're like, if I had no, if I had one last meal in the world, 
it would be this exact meal. It's so delicious. So out of those two people, who would you say, hey, pat on the back, buddy, for sticking with the tough diet, you know, credit to you and praise to you. You give it to the first person for whom this is a daily struggle and something difficult. The other person, there's no praise that's necessary or even legitimate because they're not doing something that is hard for them. They're doing something which they already enjoy. So when you do the right thing, just because it feels good or it's fun, then that's not a moral reason for doing it. So Kant's basically saying that even when you do the right thing, it's not really something that has any moral value unless you're doing it because of the moral principle and not because of the pleasure about it. So anyway, um, when you act from the motive of duty to uphold the moral law, that's when you're acting with a good will. And only actions that are done from the motive of duty have moral worth. Actions from the motive of inclination don't have any moral worth. Here's what he says about it um, in the book. This is his discussion of that same shopkeeper example. So quickly, he says it here on 107. He says, um, I set aside actions which are really in accordance with duty, yet to which men have no immediate inclination, but perform them because they are impelled by some other inclination. Because in this case, to decide whether the action which is in accordance with duty has been done from duty or from a selfish purpose is easy. The difference is more, more difficult to note in a case where the action accords with duty and the subject has, in addition, an inclination to do it. So, like, duty would require this action, but you also have some kind of inclination in favor of it, like you desire to. For example, that a dealer should not overcharge an inexperienced purchaser certainly accords with duty, and where there is much commerce, the prudent merchant does not overcharge, but keeps to a fixed price for everyone in general, so that a child may buy from him just as well as everyone else. Thus, customers are honestly served. But this is not nearly enough for making us believe that the merchant has done this from duty and from the principle of honesty. His own advantage required him to do it. He cannot, however, be assumed to have, in addition, an immediate inclination toward the buyer, causing him, as it were, out of love to give no one, as far as price is concerned, an advantage over another. Hence, the action would be done neither from duty nor from inclination, but merely for a selfish purpose. And so I guess also he mentions there, suppose that the shopkeeper um, gives a fair price to the young patron but not because he recognizes that that's what duty requires and morality requires, but instead because he's fearful that if he gets caught ripping him off and then this is discovered, maybe it'll be like a negative Yelp review or something, and it will undermine the profitability of his business going forward. In that case, again, it would be like doing the right thing, but not based on a moral basis, just doing it because of the perceived advantage that comes from having done it. So if you simply do moral actions, but only because you see some advantage in it, then you're not doing it based on a moral reason. You're instead doing it from inclination's sake. And following your inclinations is not the same thing as following the moral law, because in many cases, what you're inclined to do will deviate from what the moral law requires you to do. And in those cases, if your inclination is the dominant factor, you're going to break away from morality. So think about a person who finds a wallet, and they see the identity of the person in the driver's license of the wallet, and there's money in the wallet. And they're thinking this. Well, maybe I return this wallet, they'll give me a reward or they'll give me the money that's in there. So that's their motive. Now, is it the right thing? Is it duty Is it duty that requires them to return the wallet? Yes. But in that case, would the person be doing it simply because it's the right thing on principle? No, they'd be doing it because of the inclination to receive the reward. Um, so doing the right thing for the wrong reason, for self-interest or advantage, according to Kant, that deprives the action of moral worth. We wouldn't say someone was being moral if they did this just on the pretense that they would receive some kind of reward. The more, the more moral example would be a person who says, I won't receive an award, and it'll be a hassle to me to find the person, and it'll just take time and energy away from my life, but I have to do it even though it's not going to make me happy at all, just because morality requires me to do it, and morality is not the same thing as pursuing happiness. Okay, so that's Kant's way of looking at it. I'm just giving you a few different examples based on his original shopkeeper example. Okay, so there's one last thing that's left over from Kant. We were told by Kant that you should act from a sense of duty to uphold the moral law. That's what you ought to do. That's what your moral obligation is um, based on his theoretical reasoning. But what is the moral law, though? What are we supposed to act from a sense of duty to uphold the moral law? But how can we know what it is and what is it? Well, Kant says there is a moral law. And he says the moral law exists and it's objective and it's universal and it's timeless, which means that it does not change from person to person or from place to place or time to time. Now that might strike you as a really radical kind of idea because probably you have moral relativism as like a given in your mind. Like two people don't agree on abortion, whether it's right or not, and there's no answer. Well, Kant says there are objective answers to moral questions and that there's a moral law that doesn't shift or change 
over time, over culture, or from person to person. But what's the moral law? How do we find it out? Kant says that we have to utilize reason, and reason, human reason, will help us access and unlock what the moral law contains and what it tells us we must do and what we must not do. So reason, human reason, it's what makes us human beings. It's what makes us the higher life forms on this planet that we are. The reason that I can talk to you, that you can understand this lecture, read a book, use technology, do mathematics, play sports, play musical instruments, is because we have reason. You know, the m monumental achievements of man, whether it's technological, scientific, um, in aviation or aeronautics or space travel, we've been able to do those things because we understand rational principles about reality and we've been able to apply them. So what Kant says is that when we use reason, we can also discover not just you know, the value of pi or how to split an atom and build nuclear weapons or a microwave or uh, whatever. We can also use reason to tap into and unlock the moral law. So the same source that can give us knowledge in all these other fields can also access and unlock and reveal the moral law too. Um, now, where does reason come from? That's kind of an open question. He says it could be that it's given to us by God. You know, so God creates us in his image, but gives us knowledge of good and evil, like they say in the Bible. Another possibility is that reason has just been naturally evolved and it's endowed on us by natural selection over a long process of change and time in that way. But wherever it has come from, and Kant, I guess, leaves it as an open question, we certainly have it. And so we'll use reason to discover the moral law. When we use reason to discover what the moral law is, he says we will reflect on this principle, which he calls the categorical imperative. So Kant's categorical imperative. This is a key idea, a kind of capstone to his philosophy of ethics. Categorical imperative. <clears throat> so the categorical imperative is like this master principle of Kant, which is supposed to organize our reflection on the moral law. There are two versions of the categorical imperative. And so we utilize this principle to discover what the moral law commands and forbids. So there are two versions of it, and let me write, write the first one here. So version one of the categorical imperative. What it says is this. It's going to look a little technical at first, but I'll help you understand that in a minute. What it says is <clears throat> act always so that the maxim... which describes your action could be willed to be a universal law. Okay, so categorical imperative version one. Act always so that the maxim which describes your action could be willed to be a universal law. So for us to figure out what that means, we have to dive into some of the words there. What is a maxim, first of all? Okay. So a maxim, in Kant's terminology, is like a person's principle of action, or it's, it's an individual's policy of action behind an intended deliberate act that they do. So for every action that you do of your own free will, deliberately, voluntarily, there's a maxim associated with it. And again, it is like your policy or principle behind the action. It's a basic statement which says what you do under certain kinds of circumstances. So a maxim can take a, takes a certain kind of form. So this is still categorical imperative here, version one. Here's the form of a maxim. It's a principle uh, which has the following format. I will do some action X in certain circumstances, and I'm labeling the action with a variable X because it could be any number of possible things, and the circumstances I'm labeling with the letter C because the circumstances can vary also. So we can just plug things in for X and C to understand a particular maxim. How about right now, okay? so. Right now, one thing I know you're doing is watching a lecture on YouTube for, for philosophy class. So we can, uh, we can figure out your maxim about your current situation. So I'll get you started. The first part of it is I will attend a lecture. But now I have to ask you about the circumstances. So what is your policy? Not, the, not me, my policy of attendance. But what is your personal policy, you the one individual? What, what circumstances compel you to attend a class? 
It doesn't have to be anything too lofty or noble. It won't upset me if you just say something very practical. But uh, what do you say is the right way of completing that maxim? I will attend class lecture in what circumstances? Like what are these circumstances that are leading you to do this attendance right now? I'm just asking for the policy. You shall attend in what circumstances? According to you. <clears throat> okay, to get a good grade, I like that, Gabby. But as I was saying a moment ago, it's very noble and virtuous. Some people will say, I just attend because I'm required to attend or something. But um, to learn, yes, that's also quite uh, ideal and good and virtuous. But I was thinking just kind of something even more basic. Like, for example, I will attend lecture in case I'm able to and in case it is in session at that time. Also similar, Isaac, yeah, to obtain the credits to graduate. Um, but attendance at one meeting is only a small part of that much larger project. Anyway, though, let's just go with the way I've specified it. I think that's a fair-minded way of putting it because if nothing else, I know that you're here at least because this is, a, this is the time slot of the class and also because you're not otherwise unable, like sick, disabled, or in the midst of some emergency or whatever. So assume that that's a student's maxim, whether it's the specific maxim that you would have expressed or not. I will go to a class lecture in case I'm capable of it and it is scheduled at that time. Okay, now, what the categorical imperative version one says is with the, with the maxim that you have, consider what it would be if this maxim was converted into a universal law, okay? So when we like elevate an individual maxim to a universal law, it takes a slightly different form. Here's the form of the universal law statement. I put UL for universal law. It's just the statement that all people will do X in the same circumstances, C. Okay, so now the maxim that we began with, that I will attend class when I'm able to and it is in session, becomes the universal law that all people will attend their classes when they're able to and when it is in session. So if that were the universal law, that would not uh, be undesirable, nor would it be impossible. All it would mean is that people just go to their duly scheduled classes in case they're able to be there. And that would not be problematic. That would not be impossible nor undesirable. So this action passes the bar of morality and it's permitted under the moral law. So congratulations, you've done nothing wrong by attending this class right now because you're doing so based on a maxim that can be universalized and therefore it's permitted under the moral law. The more interesting cases to consider though are actions that are based on bad maxims that couldn't be universal laws. The categorical imperative advises that in those cases that is an immoral action which is morally impermissible. So let me give you some of those. That's where I think this has even greater interest. Take the case of a long line, okay? So if you've ever waited in a long line, and probably you have, they're sometimes annoying, especially when you're far at the back. You're like getting impatient wishing he was moving faster or that you were closer to the front. So suppose there's one person like this in a long line and they're getting really just tired of waiting. So they think about taking a certain action to expedite this, the scenario that they're in. So I'm hinting at what? A person is toward the back of the line losing their patience and they're thinking maybe that they'll just do what? This person, what might they think of doing in order to advance their position in the line? You kind of feel where I'm going with this? We're talking about a person who's thinking of doing what? Just working with you to cut. That's right, Jasmine, to cut the line, to just cut ahead. Okay, so let's consider the maxim of the cutter, right? I will cut in a line, and what's the circumstance in our hypothetical? The person says, I, what's their policy, basically? I cut a line under what case, under what condition? What's the person's principle or policy? I shall cut a line in circumstance of what? In case what? Again, I think this one's pretty easy to say, but what's the given circumstance? <clears throat> so we got the X part, now C. Just whenever it's long, I guess. David, you say when it's not moving, Maybe that's one way to put it, but uh, if it wasn't moving, it was very short, I guess you might not have the same temptation to cut. So I was just thinking, yeah, I will cut when there's a long line that I'm standing in, okay? So suppose that's the maxim. Now, convert that into a universal law statement. Now it says what? All people will do what? All people will cut lines when the line is long. Now ask yourself, 
Could that possibly be a universal law? I'm not talking about most people cutting or some, but literally 100%. Because when you elevate this to a universal law, you have to think hypothetically. Like, what if literally everybody acted the same way in the same situation? So if 100% of all people cut whenever there was a line, how would that go? Would it even be possible? No, because it would destroy the line itself. See, lines require people to put, maintain a single file position in, in a line structure. But if everybody's trying to cut, then there's simply a mob of people all massing toward the front, and there's no longer any kind of organization as to how people can be admitted one by one. Um, so if everybody cuts, there's no longer any line to cut, and therefore it's kind of not even possible for 100% of people to cut. Furthermore, okay, now we get to the undesirability of this being a universal law, because it's also undesirable. Even from the point of view of the cutter, does the cutter him or herself or themselves, does that person want everybody to cut like they're cutting? You understand? Does the cutter wish that 100% of the people would cut along, along with them? No. Because if everybody cut, then it would kind of make it, um, it would destroy the point of cutting. Because if 100% of the people cut, then what would happen to the person's position in the line as soon as they cut? If the cutter cuts and everybody else did too, then what would happen when they cut it? Can you answer that one for me? The question is just imagine that everybody cuts. Then if one person cut, clearly, what would happen afterwards? Would they get, would they advance forward in the line or not? Why, why not? Because <clears throat> the point, of, point here is would the cutter want everyone to do the same thing? And so I'm asking you to work through that hypothetical. What if everybody did do the same thing? Then what would be the case with the cutter? As soon as that person cut, we would simply have what happened. Just let me know in the chat. <clears throat> yeah, they'd cut the same, they'd cut the person again, and so they would not be able to advance in the line, right? So suppose you're back here, cut, get, well, maybe this is a better way of looking at it. You're at this point of the line, you want to be up closer to the front, so you cut here. But then all the people that you've cut just cut in front of you, and so you're, you're back at the back again. So, in fact, the cutter does not want everybody to cut. To the contrary, the cutter wants everybody else, except for them, to respect the rules of the line so that when they break that rule, they can exploit everybody else who is following the same rule. So it doesn't work to their advantage if everybody simultaneously does the same thing. Therefore, we've learned something. The cutter realizes, if they just think about it using their reason, that they're doing something that cannot possibly be done by everybody. And by the way, they don't even want everybody to do it either. So beneath the somewhat jargon and sophistication of this statement, it's saying something I think that's kind of simple. When you take an action, you just have to make sure that you're doing an action that could also be done by everybody else. If you're taking an action that is not possible for everybody to do, or you would not want everybody to do it yourself, then stop doing it. You know it's wrong. It's only acceptable morally to do actions that could, could conceivably be done by everybody else in the same circumstances. So whenever you're creating like an exception to the rule for yourself, you're saying, I'm doing something, but it would not be possible or it would not be okay for everybody to do this, then you're not supposed to do it either. I'll give you other examples along the same lines. Um, so Khan talks about this one himself. Suppose that you were low on money and you wanted someone to give you like some extra cash. But you know they won't give it to you unless you make a promise to repay it as a loan. Suppose though that this person is dishonest and they don't want to pay it back, so they, but they still want the loan to be given to them. So they decide this. I'm just going to lie. I'm going to say, hey, I'll pay you back. Don't worry. And that'll give the money. That'll cause them to lend me the money. And then I'll never repay it. So their maxim then is this, I will lie about repaying a loan whenever I want money. Now, if that was the universal law, then who would lie when they requested loans? All people that request and draw loans. And if that was the case, would the loans even be generated anymore? No, because all lenders would know that it's not the exception, it's the rule that everybody, 100% of them lie when they ask for such loans. So under those circumstances, these would all be laughed off as obvious lies, and the one that's requesting the loan would not be able to get it. So does the liar, him or herself, want everybody to lie about these loans? No. They hope that most people tell the truth so that their current lie will escape undetected as an exception to the general rule that people do tell the truth when they request these loans. So again, you can see that it's inconsistent. In that case, the person's doing something that wouldn't even be possible if everybody did the same thing. And they're doing something that if everybody did the same thing, it would make it impossible for their action to even meet with success. So whenever you do things, double check on your principle and then consider what it would be if that was a universal law for everybody. 
And if it's not possible for everyone to do it, or if it's undesirable for all to do so, then you're doing the wrong thing, and that's the moral law that you're violating. Here's what he said about that example. <clears throat> so on page 109, he says that a man finds himself in, uh, forced to borrow money. He knows that he won't be able to repay it, but he sees that he won't get any loan unless he promises to repay it. He wants to make the promise, but he still has conscience to ask himself whether it's not okay and is contrary to duty to get out of difficulty like that. Suppose, however, that he decides to do that. The maxim of his action would then be, when I believe myself to be in need of money, I will borrow money and promise to pay it back, although I will not pay it back. Now, this principle may be compatible with his own self-interest, but the question now is whether it's morally right. So I transform this into a universal law and put the question thus, how would things stand if this maxim were to become a universal law? He then sees at once that such a maxim could never hold as a universal law of nature and be consistent, but must be self-contradictory because the universality of a law, which says that anyone who believes himself to be in difficulty could promise things with no intention of keeping the promising, would make promising itself and the goal to be achieved by it totally impossible, since no one would believe what was being promised, but would merely laugh at all such statements as being obvious lies. So um, if you want to take a free ride on the subway, your maxim is, I will not pay the subway fare when I ride the subway. If that's the universal law, then nobody would ever pay, and it would no longer have a funding mechanism, and therefore the service would be discontinued. But the free rider wants for there to be a service that they can ride on for free, so clearly they don't want everybody to do the same thing they are doing. They are relying on other people to pay into the system, which they can then exploit by breaking the rule and not paying on their own. So it's easy enough in a way to think about this first version of the categorical imperative. Whatever you're doing, whenever you're doing something, check the maxim you're acting on, and elevate it to a universal law and then ask, would that be okay or, per, or possible even if all did so? If they could all do it and that wouldn't be a problem, then you're not doing anything wrong. So it's okay, morally. But if you're doing an action that would not be capable of being a universal maxim or law, then it's wrong and you shouldn't be doing it. So that's the first version of the categorical imperative, but I told you there was another one too. And um, I want to make short work of version two. It's much more straightforward and simple, even though I think once you understand version one, it's not so bad. But version two of the same principle, categorical imperative, goes like this. It just says, never treat a human being as a means to an end. So respect humanity. Never treat another human being, never treat a human being as a means to an end, but always as an end in itself. Okay, so while I'm writing this, let me know in the chat, what's an end, what's a means? Go back to um, your knowledge from uh, the studies of John Stuart Mill and utilitarianism. We discussed in that lecture about how happiness or pleasure, he thinks, is the only thing that we pursue as an end and not as a means. So those words come back into action now. What's an end again and what are means? Anybody? Because now we not, we'll, we'll be able to explain this with those concepts in mind. An end is simply a formal kind of way of saying what? An end is just what? <clears throat> yes, that's right, Tina. So ends are just goals or objectives. And means, if anyone remembers, are the things that you do to achieve those different ends, the actions that you take or the methods that you use to arrive at your goals. So now the version two of the categorical imperative says this. When you are dealing with another human being like, like me or you, one of us, one of our members of our kind, our human species, human beings demand respect. And so you're not supposed to treat human beings as though they're just tools to manipulate in the pursuit of a goal that you may have. Instead, you're supposed to treat human beings like they are the goal for the sake of which you're acting. So people are subjects, not objects. And they're not to be treated as things to manipulate or exploit towards the pursuit of goals that you have, which they may not share. Now, there's all kinds of cases where people use each other as a means to an end. Take the case of theft. If I steal something from you, I'm taking um, your property away from you for my own benefit, and I'm using your wealth and income and possessions as a means to my own ends. And I'm not allowing you to make a decision about it if I act through theft. If I, if it, well, I, I would never do this, and I hope none of you ever would, but take the case of rape, right? If in rape, a person has bypassed consent to pursue some kind of 
well, disgusting sexual pleasure that they get from the non-consensual act. But in that case, they're using the human being and their body as a means to the pursuit of that pleasure, and they're not treating the human being as a goal in themselves. Um, if there was a crazy mass shooting and everyone was running for cover, including you, and an even bigger and stronger guy came up behind you and grabbed you and put you in front of him like a human shield so that they wouldn't get hit by bullets, that would be using you and your body as a means to his goal of survival. But you're a human being, not a table or a chair or an inanimate object. So you're not to be treated that way. You're supposed to be treated as though you are a goal rather than a means to some goal. Um, so, I mean, these are all just different examples of ways people could be treated as a means. And here's the general framework of when you treat someone as a means. And this is something that Nora O'Neill said in one of our companion pieces listed in the syllabus. She says you treat someone as a means when you involve them in an interaction that they would not consent to. Okay, so that's when you treat someone as a means and when you violate this categorical imperative. When you do something with or to another person that that other person would not give full and free consent to under full information. So like rape, of course, it's by definition not consented to by the victim. And so in that case, you involve someone in interaction and they don't consent to their part in it. When you steal from a person, this is not a gift given to you by the victim and therefore they have not consented to be um, the victim of theft. That's why it's wrong. Um, I don't know, it, you know, all manner of force, fraud, exploitation, and coercion that use someone else to get to a goal for yourself are violations of the moral law according to the second version of the categorical imperative. So ask yourself before you're doing an action, am I going to do something with or to another person that they would not agree to if they knew exactly all the facts? If the answer is yes, then you shouldn't do it because it's wrong. It's a violation of the other person's humanity and the respect that they deserve. If you were treated as a human shield by some stronger party, I know that you'd feel righteously aggrieved because you would say, I'm not a table or a chair. I'm a human being with my own mind, with my own reason and my own goals. So if you want to use this desk as a shield, go at it because it doesn't have its own judgment or will. But a human being like one of us is a special kind of creature. It's a thing that has judgment, will, insight, intelligence, and therefore human beings are not to be treated as means, but always as ends in themselves. Does this rule out people being helpful to each other and supporting each other's goals? No, because if the person chooses through their own free decision to be uh, serviceable to your goals, then no one has been exploited. So like if I go to a coffee shop and I buy a coffee and the barista gives me the drink, they're not being treated as a means because even though I'm getting value from the interaction, they consent to their role in the interaction because they work at will and they're free to just not do that job if they didn't want it. But if a person has been enslaved and they're put to labor um, and bondage against their will without their ability to consent, then if I, if I derive benefits from the slave's uh, productivity, then I would be exploiting that person and that would be a violation of them. Okay, so I'm going to close this discussion of Kant now. And the last thing I want to say is this. You can see a big difference between the two moral theories now. Remember that in utilitarianism, one of the big objections was that no action is totally forbidden in principle. So you can dream up a case where there's like a transplant uh, of organs from one innocent victim to five that are dying of organ failure. In utilitarian thought, it's hard to say why that's really wrong because it seems to save more lives than declining to kill. But in Kantian thought, that's clearly wrong because it violates the second version of the categorical imperative. If you kill the person to, to use their organs for others, you'd be using them very vividly as a means to the goal of the other people's health and safety. But if they've been victimized and killed against their will, then clearly that's a violation of their rights and their moral standing. So from Kant's view, it's not all about maximizing utility and generating the most happiness. It's simply living within the moral law, which means that you should always act from a sense of duty to uphold it. And that means adhering to the categorical imperative in either of its two versions. So like in the fourth choice scenario of before, where it was like save your one loved one or save 10 more numerous people in another house, Kant would not say that you're obligated to get the greater number of people saved. Because if you're acting on the maxim that says, when I can save a family member, I will, that could easily be a universal law and it wouldn't produce any kind of undesirable effect or contradiction. And also, um, 
it's not using those, anyone as a means when you save the one individual because though those others would die, um, they're not being killed by you and you didn't put them in the situation that they're in. So it's not like they're being exploited for your benefit or something. Okay, guys, so that's everything I wanted to say about Kant. It did take a little while to cover it all, but better late than never. And now we're done with that. So we continue. Now, having looked at ethical theories, two of the big ones, Kantianism, utilitarianism, we're going to start to see how these theories can actually be applied to the consideration of real ethical dilemmas and debates in the world that we are in. And so the topic of ethical debate I kind of want us to look at, which is in our book, is the issue of economic inequality in the world. And in particular, do we first world citizens, you know, living in the industrialized first world, America and, and et cetera, do we have a moral obligation to assist financially or otherwise the global poor? Do we have any moral obligation to help out those that are living in absolute poverty and hunger? And you're going to find that there are different viewpoints on this. There's just like with everything in philosophy, contrary arguments on both sides. So some say that we do have a moral obligation that maybe we're not taking care of to do better for the poor of the third world. And that's one ar argument we're going to look at starting today. There's another author who has a totally opposite point of view. That's Garrett Hardin. And he says um, that we do not have a moral obligation to assist the global poor. And in his argument, he even goes a little further and says that, in fact, it's not even really uh, to anyone's benefit to do that in the long run, if you look at the long-term effects of such international aid. But we're going to try and study both arguments. And that means we're getting started now with one of them, and that's by this author, Peter Singer. Okay, so Peter Singer is a still living, very famous, well-known philosopher. He was born in 1942, still going strong. Um, and we're reading an article from him that come, came out in 1993 called Rich and Poor. Peter Singer, just a little bit of background on him. He's an Australian um, philosopher, but he's taught at a lot of important Ivy League institutions, including Princeton. He's probably actually one of the most famous and well-known philosophers that's living today. He wrote a very famous and well-known book in the 70s when he was still pretty young, uh, which is called Animal Liberation. That's considered a kind of classic in ethics because um, it really kind of ushered to the forefront of society debate the case of animals and whether we have any moral obligations to take better care of them is factory farming, unethical, etc. Well, Peter Singer, using utilitarian style moral reasoning, does make an argument in that book that the status quo concerning the way we treat animals is, is immoral. And so he makes a very you know com compelling argument in favor of moral vegetarianism and stuff like that. That was in the 70s at a time where the social consciousness around that issue was pretty low. And of course, now it seems to be a much bigger issue, you know, the whole vegetarianism, veganism, wellness type movement gaining greater footing. But anyway, um, <clears throat> he doesn't just care about that one topic. He's written on all sorts of things within the world of ethics, including, you know, the haves and the have nots. And that's what this paper of 1993 is all about. So anyway, Peter Singer, Australian philosopher, kind of living legend in a way, and his paper from 93, Rich and Poor. So his thesis in the essay is straight up, we have an obligation to help the global poor. We have a moral obligation to do that in the first world, and if we don't do it, we're deficient on our moral obligation. But that's just you know, a very oversimplified statement of it. Let's get into the details of how he builds his case. So, um, <clears throat> just opening my notes to this new author. Okay, so let's get into some facts about poverty, because that's basically how he starts the paper off. The first thing he mentions is a concept uh, which is first defined by Robert McNamara, the former U.S. Defense Secretary. He coined the phrase absolute poverty as a way of describing some of the extremities of poverty that we see around the globe. So here's this concept, absolute poverty, and the definition. So absolute poverty is basically not having enough income or wealth to, make, to meet the basic human needs of food, clothing, and shelter, all right? So not having enough income slash wealth to do what? To meet the basic human needs of three big things, food, clothing, and shelter.
Okay, absolute poverty. So imagine that that no matter like all the wealth and income that you make from wherever you derive money, whether it's labor or family money, suppose that all of it goes just to these three things and there's nothing left over. So all of your money is completely uh, invested in just having enough food to eat, having a place to sleep, and having clothes on your back. And it's not even enough. It's not even enough for that. So you have to kind of like compromise on these different things because the meager amount of income and wealth that you do have isn't even sufficient to fully fund the basic baseline necessities. Now, is this a common condition? Yeah, it's actually quite prevalent in the world. Even according to conservative estimates from 1993, the estimate would range from 500 million to 1.2 billion people that are living in absolute poverty currently. But this is now 2021, it's 28 years after the date of publication here, and the global population is significantly larger. So all the facts and stat statistics that he gives in his paper are just significantly larger now. So anyway, it's upwards of 1.2 billion for sure. A significant portion or fraction of the global population overall are living in absolute poverty. And um, if you're living that way, then you don't have the basic food and nutrition that's needed to sustain physical and mental health. You'd be constantly hungry. Literally, we're talking about fighting off starvation, not just like, oh, I'm hungry right now. I can't wait to get a meal. And then you just get one. But you're literally facing some malnutrition, malnourishment, and possible death of starvation. Not only that, but in parts of the world where absolute poverty prevails, there's also low literacy, poor public sanitation, a lot of opportunistic diseases and infections. So you're struggling to survive, really, in an utterly degraded set of conditions. Now, some people, you know, it's hard to get them to have a soft spot for the poor. Some people look at the international poor and they have kind of a cynical reaction that, oh, well, are these people not industrious enough? Or is this a country where the policies of the government haven't served the people well enough and they just haven't rebelled against it. You know, some people want to blame those that are poor for their own poverty. But even if you have that kind of disposition, it's really hard to say such a thing about little children, right? You know, we're not just talking about able-bodied adults that are lazy and not working hard enough, but what about little children? Children don't have any choice where they're born or what circumstances they're born into. And it's not like absolute poverty just hits, you know, grown-ups. But it kills a lot of kids, too. Every year, we're talking about like 14 million plus children dying from lack of adequate nutrition, basically starving. So he says, we in the first world industrialized countries like America, the wealthiest nation of all, literally at the top of the pyramid of wealth. Um, we don't really get to see the full extent and the full depth, the full scale of human poverty in our everyday lives. Because, right, who are the poorest of the poor in our own domestic communities in our own country well you know the homeless and like if you've ever seen probably you have homeless encampments skid row stuff like that people living in tents but the author points this out that even the poorest among us in our country like the homeless are still living in relative conditions of abundance if you were to just compare their case to the case of third world poor living in absolute poverty like on the plains of west africa and stuff maybe you've seen video or footage but sometimes people and even children will appear to be like walking skeletons, right? With, you know, insects flying around them, buzzards like circling them. Um, in the first world, even when you're very poor and homeless, we have enough social assistance programs and surplus wealth available in the citizens of the country that even by panhandling or finding some kind of social program to assist you, you're going to be able to meet your daily nutritional inputs and you're not going to literally starve to death or look like a skeleton. So he's basically just pointing out that there are levels to poverty, uh, and even the poorest of the poor in our own country pale in comparison to the depths and extremities of poverty that you'd see in parts of the third world. So absolute poverty kills. It makes people's lives short, miserable. Um, and so remember what I said, that for Peter Singer sees himself as a utilitarian-minded minded philosopher ethically. And utilitarianism says that you should always take the action that generates the most overall happiness for the greatest number of people. So it's all about maximization of happiness and pleasure. Well, if absolute poverty makes people's lives short, nasty, difficult, and kills them even, then it's a totally a drain. It's the opposite of happiness. So he says if one is a utilitarian, and that means that they care a lot about the maximization of human happiness, then they should see absolute poverty as one of the biggest threats to that, one of the biggest counterweights to human happiness, dragging it down. So that means that he says, on an ethical basis, we should have some motivation, if we are thinking as utilitarians, to at least improve upon this status quo, because he thinks of it as unacceptable, right? So <clears throat> in philosophy, a lot of times, and you guys have already been exposed to this, 
you study arguments where there are hypothetical scenarios and thought experiments. And to be honest, I don't have any problem with that, nor do most philosophers, because it's just interesting. It helps you focus on certain features of the argument. But to the beginning student in philosophy, sometimes it's a little um, frustrating because you might think, well, how far removed is this from reality or from practical things? Well, at least with Peter Singer in this paper, we're definitely not talking about a hypothetical scenario. This is not just a made-up uh, fictional situation. Absolute poverty is a real factual background condition of the world right now. And it's not something that comes and goes. You know, today in Long Beach where I'm at, we had some rain. And tomorrow it'll probably be gone and the sun will be back. So weather can kind of be bad one day, better the next. But absolute poverty doesn't take a break. It's not like, oh, it's here for a few days and then it kind of clears up for a while and then it kind of comes back again. No, absolute poverty is there all the time. If we want to turn our attention to it, we can turn our attention to it at any time. It's just that it's not served up to us really in our domestic news media, which is mostly preoccupied, whether good or bad, on you know political affairs of our own country and uh, things of that kind. But Singer reminds the reader, don't assume that all is well around the globe when there's nothing wrong happening in our personal lives or in our own country. Um, so the next thing he says is this. I'm going to erase to create some more notes. Um, he knows that some people might find objection to what he's saying, like let's do something about global poverty. They might object right off because they could think it's, uh, it's impossible to fix this problem. This is just a futile thing to even want to change it. Some people might say, it's inevitable that there's going to be people starving and hungry because there's just not enough food for all the people. So he doesn't agree with that, Peter Singer. He says the problem of global hunger is actually not a problem of scarcity of resources, but rather it is a problem of poor distribution and waste of the available resources. So let me write that here, and then I'll try to explain what he's saying here. Okay, this is Peter Singer talking. So he says the problem of global hunger is not a problem of scarcity of resources. <clears throat> What is it then? Well, it is actually, he says, a problem of poor distribution and waste of available resources. <clears throat> not about scarcity, is about poor distribution and waste. So um, <clears throat> here's why he has to make this point, because someone can reply to his initial claim that we have a big global problem with hunger and we should do something about it. Someone could reply back, no, uh, because it's just impossible to do anything about it. Here's why someone would say that. They could argue that um, on this planet we just have more people than we have uh, the ability to provide food for. So there's too many people and not enough food. If that's the case, some people are inevitably not going to get enough. I don't know if any of you guys have ever um, played or heard of the game Musical Chairs. Let me just make a little analogy. Hopefully this will help you understand what I'm saying. With Musical Chairs, like a group of people, they walk around a set of chairs in a circle and there's music playing. But the problem is that there's not enough chairs for all the people. So once the music stops, everyone's got to try to take a seat. But since you have more people than seats, someone's not going to get a seat and then they're eliminated from the game. Okay, now in the world you could say, we have too many people and not enough food. So with too many people and not enough food, some people just don't get uh, some of the food and they don't get to survive as well. Is that the case? Is it just impossible to feed all the hungry people with scarce available resources and too many mouths? Well, Peter Singer says, no, actually that's not true because here's the thing, we could have enough food to feed all the people that want it around the world and correct the problem of global hunger, but, we're wasting a lot of that food, and we're also poorly distributing the food that we could produce. There's two real reasons that he says this, okay? So number one, and this might sound like um, expected from a person who wrote the Animal Liberation book, but he says, in the Western world, we have a heavy reliance on animal agriculture and the meat-based diet, right? So like meat is like the staple of uh, the Western diet. And because of the massive amount of factory farming that we engage in to meet the demand of the consumer, um, we actually divert a ton of consumable resources to livestock, cattle, and other farm animals that we want to bring up for market consumption. 
And if we directly diverted consumable resources to human beings instead of fattening up cows and pigs and chickens, we could uh, more effectively and efficiently feed an even larger cohort of human beings than the current global population. So he's pointing out that if we sort of uh, changed our consumer and dietary habits in the West, de-emphasizing the central role of meat, if there was like some kind of big movement toward vegetarianism, then that would result in so much savings of consumable resources that we could actually provide enough food for everybody. And he's not saying that because he thinks it's realistic that we're going to see, you know, mass conversion to vegetarianism and then that solves the problem of global hunger. But he wants to just point it out as a way of saying that it's not theoretically inconceivable that we could make changes to our individual and uh, social practices that could at least improve upon or make a dent in the problem of global hunger and poverty. So that's one thing. The reliance on animal agriculture actually diverts a lot of food that animals then have to eat to be produced for the market away from human beings. And then the other thing is just waste. Okay, a lot of food just goes into the landfill in the Western world. You know, people, the consumer habits that we have, we sometimes have eyes bigger than our stomachs, as they say. So people buy a lot of food that they end up having to dispose of, um, filling their pantry because they couldn't get to, to cooking it. Sometimes when you go out to eat, you order a big platter and you can't finish it and some of it goes in the trash. So here we are with more food uh, that we purchase than we can eat and there's a lot of people in the world starving. So if we we're a little more frugal and, um, and um, conscientious about the way that we waste food also, that could also result in a lot of savings. So anyway, he says, let us not excuse ourselves into inaction by saying this is an unsolvable problem. So trying to take action to fix it is just a non-starter. He says, not really. Um, if we think hard enough, we can actually consider ways that this problem could be at least improved. If we wanted to, we could transfer at least some of the wealth that we have in the first world to the citizens of the third world and make an improved global hunger without even undermining our own welfare or well-being in any significant way. So the next thing he does is he's talked about poverty a little. Now he wants to see the other side of the coin and talk about affluence for a moment. So next term that is defined is absolute affluence. And absolute affluence is easy enough to understand because it's defined, um, it's defined in the exact contrary way to absolute poverty. So what is absolute affluence? It's this. It's having more than enough income or wealth to meet the basic human needs of food, clothing, and shelter. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> some people in the world don't have enough money to even meet these basic needs. But we, on the other hand, at least according to the way this definition is given, are on the opposite side of the coin. We're living in absolute affluence, everybody, meaning that even after you take whatever income or wealth that you have to provide for your basic food, nutrition, and shelter and clothing, you still have leftover money to spend on any number of other non-essential things that are just kind of wants rather than needs. Um, I'm certainly on the same boat with you guys if you're thinking about this. Um, Take, for example, that after I pay my rent, have the clothes that I'm wearing and food in my fridge, I still have money left over to buy all kinds of random stuff, like even the, just this watch that I'm wearing. This is over like a $1,000 watch. Uh, I didn't give it to any kind of aid agency or anything. And so I guess just as an example, if I buy a PlayStation 5 this summer, which I do want to do, that's another example of something that's um, an additional expense beyond just my basic needs. And that's true of all of us, right? I'm not just picking on myself. Like any number of us, we could buy new shoes, new outfits, something that we think looks cool, entertainment, technological gizmos and gadgets, vacations, uh, second car, whatever the case may be. So <clears throat> we live with absolute affluence. There are a lot of people living in total poverty and don't have enough to even meet the basic needs. So he returns to the contrast between these haves and have-nots. When you look at the people that are living in absolute poverty, over a billion, the average per capita income for that whole cohort, well, in 1993 dollar figures, was $200 per year. Can you imagine that? I mean, well, it's 28 years later. So accounting for the rate of inflation, maybe that $200 figure reported in his essay could be doubled now. So let's place it somewhere at like $365 in a year. Imagine if that was your budget for one full calendar year. How hard would it be to live? 
we're not talking about the purchasing power that 365 US dollars would have at the rates of exchange in another country if you converted it to their currency. We're talking about its purchasing power here in this country. So, I mean, it'd be very hard to live, right? I mean, you'd be going on like a dollar a day. How would you do it? Well, you'd have to do what people in the third world actually do, which is in many cases pool together in large communal living situations, oftentimes extended families, and pool together everyone's meager income and labor work um, to then buy and purchase like surplus amounts of food, which can be carefully rationed off over the long term so that everyone can just meet the basic needs of survival. So it'd be very hard to live that way. Um, people that are living in the third world that way look at people like us as just icons of wealth, even those that, of us that see ourselves as having humble circumstances. For example, I've had friends that went into the Peace Corps after college, right? And um, in one case, I had a friend that went over to Ghana, which is you know a country in Africa that needed educational assistance and humanitarian aid. And so she worked there providing educational assistance to them. But while you're there as a worker for um, Peace Corps, little kids and stuff that are out there, they can tell that you're a Westerner because of your appearance, manner of speech and your dress. And um, they kind of flock to those aid workers and you know ask for like candy or gifts because we just sort of represent to them wealth beyond their wildest dreams, even in our own humble circumstances that we think we are in. So he asks, can't we transfer some of that surplus wealth that we would otherwise just spend on non-essential things to the cause of relieving global poverty and couldn't we do that without even really touching our own basic self-interest that much? So how much is being transferred over socially from the wealthy countries to the poor? Well, he says that's a little bit of a disappointing story. So the United Nations in 1993 had a target goal of 0.7% of the gross domestic product of the wealthy industrialized nations. That that much could be diverted to a joint fund to help um, improve on the conditions of global poverty in the third world. So 0.7% of GDP, that's the annual economic output of the country. The, the ask was divert seven-tenths of 1% of that to this cause, which is modest and is achievable, really. But even that modest and achievable goal was not met. So like the UK at the time that he wrote this was at point, um, let me get the numbers right. I think that, no, I do know it. It was 0.31%. Germany, same time period. A little bit more generous, 0.41%, but still fell, fell short. Japan, just to list a couple of major, you know, first world countries, 0.4, uh, sorry, 0.32. And then the United States, the wealthiest of all nations, not the most generous on this score anyway, at 0.15%. So anyway, then he comes to this kind of big tough question: If we could give more aid that would save lives, and we withhold on it, then um, is that any way of being comp compared to the moral conduct of a killer? Because a person who kills, right, they take actions, they commit actions intentionally which lead to death. But when you withhold on assistance, the argument could be given that if the assistance would have prevented death, then withholding on the aid achieves the same outcome as killing would have. So is there any way of comparing morally the case of those that fail to assist with those that kill? Now. Um, I know, and I'm sure you're thinking the same thing, that that is perhaps a little bit too much. To say that those of us that don't give to charity could have any com comparison with a killer, I'm sure most all of us would resist that comparison. But what is the difference between killing and failing to assist? So here's where Peter Singer is going to take us next. He wants to go through the claimed differences between killing and failing to assist because he wants to show recognition that they actually are different. And in the end, he's going to concede that killing is worse. Yes, it's not exactly a, that failure to assist is on the same level of wrongness as killing would be. But despite that, he still maintains that it is still to some extent wrong when you fail to assist, even if killing is fair enough worse than that. So the next few steps of his article are to present what the differences are between killing and failing to assist, but then afterwards to show why none of them establish that the failure to assist is blameless. It's still blameworthy, even if the level of blame and um, immorality is exceeded by the act of killing. Okay, so now um, let me just quickly look at one thing here. I'm looking at my notes on the laptop. Okay, cool. So with Peter Singer, it's a highly detailed article. There's a little more that I have to say about it. So we're going to let this lecture on Singer roll over into the Monday meeting. But on Monday when we come back, we're going to finish with Singer, and then we're going to also talk about his opponent, which is Garrett Hardin, who argues for the opposite conclusion. So, you know, we'll have balance, and we'll see both sides.
but I'd like you guys to just keep following the syllabus. Do read the Garrett Hardin article from Monday's meeting so that you come in prepared to know about what he said. And if you haven't yet finished it or had a chance to get through it, make sure to read that Peter Singer article too so that we're all on the same page. Um, so I don't want to like rush through and compress the next couple of notes with only a few minutes left. So I think I'll just have us go in a moment here. But uh, don't forget, you know, your first essay was due today. It should be with me. Right as soon as this class is over, I'm going to go back into my inbox. And if I have any um, submissions that I haven't yet confirmed for those that have sent them since 1 p.m., I'll, I'll, I'll confirm those through email. But that's about it for today. So are we all good, everyone? Let me know. Um, I don't want to end the stream until I see that you guys are fine and that uh, your questions are, are all good and there's nothing left to do. So let me know. Are we all right? There's sometimes one student that's like, wait, I had a thought, I had a question, so I gotta wait for that. Okay, thank you so much, Diego, I appreciate it. And all the rest of you guys, Alicia, Moises, Tina, thanks again. I'll see you soon, uh, I'll be available for email anytime, as you know. Um, until next time then, have a great weekend, and take it easy, and I'll see you guys soon. Okay then, bye-bye. <clears throat>